Hi, welcome. This is Dr. John Demartini. This is one of the most amazing and inspiring shows that you can listen into. If you want to be on the edge of your seats, if you want to open up your heart, if you want to expand your mind, and you want to meet incredible people, stay tuned because you're just about to experience a transformative radio show that will change your life. And you're listening to the Dr. Pat Show that's coming up right next. Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. Talk radio to thrive by. Powerful, inspiring, and coming to you live, bringing you stories of people like you and me busting through and living life full out. Get ready to dare to wonder what your life would be like if you knew you could not fail. Hello, Dr. Pat. How are you? I am great. How are you? Awesome. Thank you for joining me here today. We're going to have some fun. Yes, we are. Um, so we have both producers here, Benny, and I think it might be Zach. Um, and uh, just a little bit of information. Generally, I'm going to come on, say hi to Benny and everybody, uh, <laughs> introduce you, break at 15, 30, and 45. But if we really get rolling, I might skip one of the breaks. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. My favorite topic. And what is, and how, what, do, what, do, which is, what, what do you mean? Uh, this is my favorite topic. Yeah. Whether you call it intuitive intelligence. We'll get into it. Hang yeah, tight here, kids. Here we go. Into- hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's so great to have all of you tune, tune us in and turn us on here, whether you're listening to the show from a variety of networks, Transformation Talk Radio, KKNW, or, or the Transformation Network channel outlets, whatever that is, we want to welcome you. Also, a special welcome to all of our Facebook folks. Thanks for watching us here today. Um, uh, Benny, how are you doing? I'm doing awesome. Thanks, Pat. Welcome okay. back for another hour. Yep. Another nail biter yesterday. Always. Yep. Another nail biter. <laughs> um, just just saying right there your ping pong match i'm sure that's what you're speaking of yes of course yeah that's what i I assume too yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. actually (laughs) my ping pong play is directly related to my guest's book topic probably how should i say it world passion Ooh. because on paper on paper Me personally, I should not beat some of the people I beat. So if on paper that's true, right, and you look at my rating and you Mm -hmm, do this, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on paper, not only should I not do that, but on paper, I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing for a living either. And so the question comes up especially if you're a less than average height quarterback like Mr. Wilson. Um, Why is it that you get to do some of the things you do in an extraordinary way? But this is the thing for me. And what is it about the steps we take in life, Benny, about the decisions we make in life? What is it about what happens when you're presented with, and I'm just going to call it an opportunity, um, then how do you face the world of possibilities in coming up with the decision that's right for you? And I'm not just talking about making gigunda decisions, but how about if you're making decision about your future? maybe your career. Maybe it's the story I told about how I got here 15 years ago, or maybe it's launching a network, or maybe it's doing something that makes no sense to anybody else. But today, that's what we're talking about a bit and much more with Paul O'Brien, who's joining me here today. Because when we think about intuitive intelligence, and what it means to make life-changing decisions with perfect timing. Is there a leaning into and ending this that could help you today? I believe there is. And this is a body of work, you know, that Paul has dedicated and committed himself to. And looking at, as a visionary entrepreneur, 
you know, who developed new software to be the largest astrologer divination website in the world, for him to do that, author several books, and then be here with us, as well as being a sought after speaker, philanthropist, has that been because he has had this enormous divine in Linda's spirit, triple Virgo plan, or is there something else operating? Well, today we're going to hear about that because I think for me, when I think about where I am today and where we're going and the messaging we're doing and the software we are developing, when I think about all of that, people always ask me, what is driving you? How do you, how do you decide these things? That's not going to be for me today. It's going to be for Paul. Paul, great to have you. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Pat. It's a pleasure to be back. You know, I tell a story and um, it's a story of how I'm even here talking to you. And it's real simple. 15 years ago, I dialed the wrong phone number. And within 10 minutes, I pulled out a credit card and I bought 13 weeks, one hour a week on an internet only show in 2003. Wow, you were way ahead of your time. But people, people, my friends wanted to literally have me committed. They're like, you can't be doing that. I mean, look, you just spent 10 years on a degree and now you're doing what? So I wanna ask you, what kinds of things have you had to move beyond the popular, let's say the popular assessment of what you should do and how you do it to bring you to this very moment? You know, that is such a great question that I think all of us can ask ourselves. And when you talked about, talk about something like that, that's what we would call a synchronicity. There are no accidents. Things happen according to some kind of plan. You can think of it as a divine plan or a higher order plan. And we don't have to know what the plan is as long as we're sensitive to the signals and willing to step outside the box. And that's what you did. And that's kind of my story too, because I got into software. I was, well, okay, how did I go against the grain? Yeah. I had a National Merit Scholarship and California State Scholarship, and I was destined to go to college and be an academic success. And it, 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 and I was voted most likely to succeed. And I actually dropped out of college my sophomore year. And because with all of those scholarships, I couldn't get any money because the state of California said my father had enough money and I was working my way through college. And I was so, I was so disillusioned by education. I, I, I came to the conclusion that school is the slowest way to learn anything. And I dropped out and I, had a friend who worked at a computer center. There were two things that happened during that period of my life that I became fascinated with. Now, how do you account for these things? How did Russell, Russell Wilson become fascinated with being a quarterback? I mean, it's the same kind of thing. Or you becoming a, 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 such a profound broadcaster, and thank you very much for what you do. Not just for having me on, but just your show in general. I just really appreciate it. I wanna speak on behalf of humanity for a second here and say, thank you, Pat for bringing what you're bringing to the world. And how do you account for that? How do we account for these uh, predilections or these uh, preordained tendencies? So like in my case, I boil it down to what fascinated me um, in my student stage of life. And so when I was in college, I became fascinated by two things. I was fascinated by this thing called the I Ching or I Ching. It's an ancient book. It's a 3000 year old Chinese book but it's more than a book, it's a divination system. What's a divination system? Well, it's like tarot cards. It's a, it's a way to use a set of archetypes in order to get some um, feedback from the universe about whatever's on your mind. And all those archetypes are inside of you. Every one of those 78 tarot cards is already inside of you. So when you pull a card and you're focused on something, there's a relationship between that event, the pulling of that card and whatever you're thinking about, that's called synchronicity. So it's where synchronicity principle operates on a set of archetypes. That's how a divination system works. And I became introduced to the I Ching when I was 19 by this co-ed at Cal Berkeley. 
and I just thought she was the cutest thing. And I was going to go along with whatever game she wanted to play. And she was showing me this. And I thought, well, okay, it's some kind of fortune telling game or something. And so I would kind of made fun of it and I cast the coins and it completely ignored my question, which was BS to begin with. And it came back with the hexagram, youthful folly, mm. which basically talks about the student who lacks respect for the teacher. Oh. And I thought, wait a minute, let's try that again. And this time, instead of making fun of it, I was testing it. And it came back with some text that said, questioning the sincerity of the seeker. I thought, geez, now it's testing me. So I made fun of it, it made fun of me. I yeah. tested, tested me, it was a mirror. It was like an energetic mirror, these archetypes. And I was just working perfectly, I guess. And so I became fascinated by that. And I studied that and used it for the rest of my life. as just another input whenever I had a problem that logic can't handle. And that's what we're talking about here, is yeah. making, making these decisions that everybody thinks is crazy, but for some reason it rings true for you. And so you just need another. So the I Ching is kind of a tool for developing intuitive intelligence, which I talk about in my book entitled Intuitive Intelligence. There's a chapter on divination and the I Ching in there. So I became fascinated by the I Ching. And then I became fascinated by software. And I had a friend who worked at a computer center. And there was this computer that took up half this room and had humongous mag tapes and a tiny little oscilloscope as a monitor. And we would go in there and play this game that he had downloaded from MIT using ARPANET, which was the very first version of the internet. And I became fascinated by software at that moment. And I decided I got to get in this. This is the uh, early 70s. I said, I got to learn about this because somebody wrote some code that delivered this immersive experience. And I go, wow, that's phenomenal. I don't really care about gaming. I've never been a gamer really right. to any great extent. But the idea that somebody could write some code that deliver an experience, I thought, I started having visions of multimedia in, in, in 20 years before CD-ROMs even came out. So I got into the software business as a secretary for that computer center because I could type. That was yes. the skill I had. So, you know, I found that being a secretary is actually a very useful position. You learn everything. And I started taking over, you know, taking the phone calls for the boss. And then I started closing deals for the boss. And that launched my career as a software marketing specialist. But I didn't really care that much about sales and marketing, although I got a lot of core competencies out of doing that for the next 15 years. And I became a, an, uh, uh, an executive for a high-tech company. But I wasn't happy. I was making a lot of money. I was on a career track, but I wasn't happy. I wasn't getting fulfillment from selling data communication software. It was very sterile. And so I found myself using the I Ching more often just to get along at work because it was a horrible culture. And one day a light bulb went off and I, I said, geez, I wish I could do this on my computer. And this was the late eighties. And we actually had Macintoshes by then. Yeah. And it was a graphical computer. So I started, so then I spent my entire life savings creating a prototype of what turned out to be the world's first I Ching software. In fact, the world's first divination software of any kind. Uh -huh. And I became an entrepreneur. Yeah. And everybody thought I was nuts. <laughs> so it's very similar to what you're saying. You know, everybody thought I was crazy. I left a high paying position on a fast track career yep. to pursue something more meaningful. So I left money for meaning. And that's my story, and that's, my, uh, that's what I wrote the book about, how to find meaning, how to define success for yourself in terms of what's meaningful for you, and then how to make the right decisions at the right time that take you in, in, in that direction that's going to be more fulfilling, that's going to be more heart-driven than ego-driven. So I've just yeah. given you a mouthful of an answer there. No, that's a great answer because what it really ties back into in the book and what you talk about in the book is something that I grabbed onto right away is when people ask me to, to uh, for lack of a better phrase, tell my story, so to speak, um, I used to tell it in a very linear way, right? right. And I'm mm -hmm. reading your book and I realize, wow. This is why I don't tell my story in a linear way, linear way or a chronological way, because, you know, synchronicity doesn't operate in that way, or at least my experience of it right. is, and, I, in your book as well. 
But to explain it to folks, I have found that it's easier to lay it out in a way that makes sense. Right. Um, I was recently asked to write a forward for somebody else's book, and, and it was about a life event and like one life event in my life. And I talked about my mom's death, her suicide, but that wasn't what I talked about. I talked about the divine alignment of a series of events in my life, especially around my stepmom, that had my mom not passed away, I would have never had the experience of my stepmom. And what I learned from my stepmom was a number of different things, but, but two things in particular, don't quit and trust your inner sense. Now, she wouldn't say it that way. She had a real Southern drawl um, and she would say it in her own way. But those two things became sort of the hallmark for, for my life. Time goes on though, right? And here we are talking about the brilliant way you've outlined this in a visionary decision-making system that I think if people could read this book or could understand in their own way what you and I are talking about today, their lives, my opinion, would change drastically immediately, immediately. Well, that's my hope. You know, the book is part memoir, but it's mostly a how-to book about yeah. this visionary decision-making process, and which really the hardest part of, the, of, of it is um, activating intuition when you need it the most. Because when we need it the most is when it's the hardest to get. It's like getting a loan from the bank. <laughs> why, why is that though? Let's talk about why that is though, because this is really, key. it is like getting a loan from the bank, right? You know, you can get a loan from the bank when you really don't need it, but when you really do need it, right? And you're kind of at the edge of something, right. uh, then, then you get the loan at 52% interest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the reason it's so hard to access intuition when you need it the most is because when you need it the most, you're usually stressed out and totally. they're, you're under the thrall of strong emotions of fear and maybe greed a little bit or, or, or just some uh, infatuation or just some really strong feeling. And that is the uh, intuition never shows up. I mean, it's basically blocked by strong emotional stuff that's going on. It's also uh, hard to perceive because of all the mental chatter that's going on in our brain. So it's basically noise in the system. You know, I use this analogy, it's like your hand, the palm of your hand. The palm of my hand is my brain, is my mind. The five fingers are the five senses, and they're like antenna. And so they're pulling in information, and vast amounts of information. And we're being bombarded, our senses are being bombarded constantly. Then you've got the chattering gears of the uh, inside the mind itself, and all the mental chatter, and, and it, they, it's almost incessant, this self-talk that's going on all the time. And so between all that, there's a lot of noise in the system. Then if you think of intuition, it's just kind of this dinky little sixth finger, uh, this little tiny little antenna, and it's small, and it's very ca calibrated to a very fine frequency. And it's getting drowned out by all the noise in the system. It's like you have a ham radio. Remember the old days? Yeah, ham yeah. Trying to dial in Bora Bora. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it's a very faint signal. And you've you got to be, very, you know, it's kind of like that, getting to the intuition with all this noise. So. We basically, the, the, the technique, there's no real way you can force it. You have to get the noise out of the way. You have to liberate yourself from all the noise and so that you can hear the still small voice or feel the, the feeling uh, that it takes, like they call it a gut feeling. You yeah. know, I have this uh, thing I coined called O'Brien's Law, and it says, the stronger the feeling, the less trustworthy it is as a basis for decision making. And that... That surprises people to hear that because they think, well, if it's the right thing, I'm gonna feel so strongly about it. Well, if you feel strongly about something like that, it's liable to be more ego than pure passion, unless it's in alignment with something that naturally fascinates you, which gets back to my case. I was fascinated by the I Ching and I was fascinated by software. And then 15 years later, I, discovered an intersection between two things I'd always been fascinated by. That's, that's what I counsel people. I don't care how old you are. 
figure out what fascinated you when you were in stage one, when you were in your 20s or your teens. Yeah. What fascinated you and then you dismissed it because your folks wanted you to be a doctor or whatever. You know, there's, there's uh, those desires that we have, those fascinations are there for a reason. Yeah, I, I love this. You know, I shared a story the other day and it's a long story, so I won't give you the whole thing, but it's this. You know, I went from suicide with the mom, homeless at 17, arrested at 19, and I went on to work for the phone company because this woman that sat across the table from me, Dara Stoner, looked at me in the eye and said, I should not hire you. You are out 48 days in your senior year. I should not hire you. Everything says don't hire you, but I'm going to hire you. There's something. I'm going to hire you. And so off we go. And I had worked my way up, worked in the mailroom right? Worked my way up, left the company because as the head of HR, I could not implement a downsizing program that targeted senior service people. I mean, I had an alien take over my body right there for that. But here's the thing. I look back at it now, Paul, and I see that there are a series of events that all hang together to get me where I am today an entire series and I was I was reading your book where you talk about to keep a synchronicity journal I think that that is probably very powerful for people to do there's so much in your book that's powerful but I went back and I started to connect the dots and mm -hmm. here's what here's what I know when I was 23 I looked at Linda my best friend to this day the producer that actually scheduled you. And I said, I'm going to get a PhD. And Linda looked at me and said, of course you will. Now, mind you, barely graduated high school. And then I looked at her and I said, what exactly is a PhD? Now, why is that even important? Because when I look back at it from what the way you present this in your book, I get a different view of things. I get the view that things might have been be might have been lining up for me to want to get a PhD only because I delivered mail to some of the most brilliant minds, Arno Penzias, the Big Bang guy, mathematicians at Bell Labs, people that I delivered mail to quiet rooms with frogs. But I delivered mail, and at the end of their name was PhD. And so my brain was. PhD is fun. And believe it or not, a lot of years later, 10 years in a program that I didn't even want to continue to pursue uh, consequences of broken promises, did I now realize that that PhD that I wanted to get got me to the place where I'm having a blast. I'm having a blast in my life. So something at age 23 that I associated with maybe took a long time, Paul, got me to the place where ultimately that relationship came to be. How would you talk about that? Uh, first of all, I'd say congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great story. <laughs> you know, I mean, you were, you know, this, this talks to the whole issue of desires and the importance of desires. And I talk about this in the book about how to manifest uh, your heartfelt desires. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people think, feel guilty about having desires. I, I was brought up to feel guilty about having wants and needs because it was terribly inconvenient for my parents. Yeah. And, um, and, 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 and it was selfish. <laughs> and so it's taken me a long time to liberate myself from that kind of inhibition and allow myself to honor my wants and needs. And, and, and the word desire, you know, like a lot of people uh, interpret Buddhism, and I really love Buddhism a lot. Uh, it's so psychologically sophisticated. Yeah. And there's the four noble truths. And the first noble truth is that life is imbued with suffering. And that's true of the life of the ego in particular, you know, subject, object, you know, it, it, no matter what you get, it's not going to be enough, or you're going to be afraid of losing it, or there's no satisfaction, like Mick Jagger said. And that's the first noble truth. The second noble truth is usually translated as the cause of the suffering is desire. 
And that's not true, that's a mistranslation. The cause of suffering is craving. The cause of suffering is addiction. So that's like desire coupled with an emotional demand. And that's a whole different order of desire. If we didn't have desires, you'd never have uh, any incentive to do anything. You'd right. never have the, the desire to become enlightened, for instance, so, uh, or, or successful or anything. So desire sort of it comes from the word desiderius, uh, from the stars, uh, sidereal. And uh, that's like from above. It's like a light from above. It's like a lodestar. And so our desires are important, and it's important that we honor them, no matter how late in life. I mean, you know, I'm a late bloomer. It's, I think there's no end to the self-discovery process. And a lot of times self-discovery at an older age in life is just basically revisiting some of the things that fascinated you at a younger age and giving them some credence. Yeah, and this is really, when, when we come back from break, I, I want you to take us on a journey because I think this is brilliant. You know, one of the things that I find, and I'm sure you, you, look, you go out, you speak about this, you work with others, you have been in this uh, energy and vibration of this for quite some time. But one of the things that I was really struck by as I started to go through the book, and I started to look at the visionary decision-making process, VDM, right? I started to look at that, and I thought, this should be taught to everybody in school at a very young age. Because I can look back now because of the wrong phone number, right? And got me on a pathway, one hour a week turned into five hours a week because guess what? The Seattle station just happened to have five days open and then another five. And I kept pulling out my credit card. But when I look at the process, this to me, is what we need, not just for how to set things in motion for ourselves, Paul, but here's the thing. We are living at such a fast pace of information flow. I, like you, was introduced to software at a very early age, and I didn't even know what it was. Honest to goodness, when they said software, I thought it was like some kind of uh, soft ice cream thing just that i mean i was so like ignorant when we come back i would love for you to take us on this journey of not just what you discovered but i think the essential for what we need to thrive in a data intense world let's take a short break everybody i have loved this book i i i love this book I wish they had a little mini like uh, I Ching version that you could pop in your pocket and stuff. When we come back, it's gonna be... you got it? Yeah, there's an app. All right. When we come we'll back, okay. let's... of course, there has to be an app. Thank you. <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> Doggy. <laughs> Sorry. Stepmom was from the South. Having a moment. Uh, look, before we go to the phone lines, Jay is going to be joining us in a minute. How do people get a copy of your book? And you do have an app, of course. So can you talk about that, how they can get a copy of the book? And then we'll talk to Jay. And then I have a funny feeling that when you talk to Jay, Jay has been with us from day one that I started the show. I have a funny feeling you'll be able to describe the process. But tell us how people get the book, get the app, all of the above. Where's my phone so I well, can get the book, it? The book is entitled Intuitive Intelligence and it's published by Beyond Words Publishing. Yeah. And it's available, of course, via Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and as well as a lot of bookstores because Simon & Schuster is putting it into distribution. Um, so it's called Intuitive Intelligence. It's not that hard to find. It's just out this week. And so I'm hoping people, if they do uh, pick it up, uh, that they give it a review on Amazon, that would really help a lot. And the app I was mentioning is an I Ching app. And I, the I Ching is that divination system I talked about, and it's called the Visionary I Ching, and it's through the Apple Store or the Google Store for iPhones or Android phones. And it's kind of a really cool way to consult the I Ching. That's another one of the books I wrote was a Western version of this Chinese classic. I know. And uh, so I, I didn't, I wanted it to be non-sexist and non-militarist and useful in modern times. And I did that back in the day in 89 when I uh, published the first software. 
but I've refined it ever since. And now we have an app and all the proceeds of the book and the app go to my nonprofit to promote nonprofit work going forward because I did so well selling uh, tarot.com, which became the world's largest astrology site that I, um, you know, I became a millionaire and, and I set up a nonprofit to give back. So everything I'm doing now, other than managing my investments, is giving back. And that's what the sale of the book and the app are all about. Well, I, I, I am so thrilled to have you on here because we put our action plan together. We are rebuilding our software. And many people don't know this. We built our own broadcasting software and it doesn't exist in the broadcasting world. Most broadcasting companies buy second, third software that right. isn't geared towards the user or the host or whoever. And we just kind of did it and we're redoing it and up leveling it. And we have an app coming out. I can't even believe I'm talking about it. Jessica said to me, uh, you got to stop saying telephone app. Nobody has a telephone pot. And <laughs> stop saying that. Um, but can you give your website, please, for people? Oh, and then right. one more time, I got a chat that came in asking, can you please say the Play Store app name again? The app is the Visionary I Ching. Okay. And the uh, website of everything that my nonprofit does, my nonprofit is called the Divination Foundation, and it's divination.com. So it's pretty simple. And there's links on divination.com to another site we have about the book, which is called intuitiveintelligence.org. So you can go to either one and they link to each other. But divination.com has a lot more stuff that we offer resources outside of the, in addition to the book, as well as some videos and, and, and things like that. Awesome. Thank you. All right, Mr. Benny. All right, we'll bring on Jay calling in from Canada. Hey, Jay, welcome back. Hey, Jay. Hey, thanks, Benny. Hey, Dr. Pat, it's great talking to you both. Hey, it's great to have you. How are you? Doing pretty good. Just listening to the show is really fascinating to, you know, listen to Paul and what he has to say. But um, I do have a question for Paul. And, yeah. and, and kind of like when we, you know, and maybe you, Dr. Pat, too, is like when we sure. get onto the spiritual path and open our eyes to what is the possibilities of things, that we can get a second our, I don't know, not beliefs, but the, the mindset, we have to eradicate almost anything that, that blocked us before, <laughs> like, you know, past life stuff or this and that, uh, you know, beliefs from our you know, parents and things like that, that we can really get stuck and bogged down in, in progressing forward in our, in our spiritual uh, aspects of ourselves. I just wondered, uh, you know, we can take course after course and then course, but I just wondered uh, what your thoughts about that is. You know, it's funny. There's a chapter in the book, Intuitive Intelligence, entitled Belief engineering. Yes. Right on the topic that you brought up. And in that chapter, I explain how, just like you said, how powerful our beliefs are, usually more in a negative way than a, than a supportive way. Because most, of, most people, what they believe or the beliefs that they cling to are whatever they adopted from their parents, whatever they were taught to believe at age four or five uh, when they were young children, and they've just stuck with that their whole life. And that includes things called core beliefs, which are subconscious beliefs. Like for instance, I had a core belief um, until I was about 30, where it went like this, and I have to be perfect in order to be lovable. And that really held me back because I was never quite good enough to feel lovable and, and attract the love that I wanted and needed in my life because I felt like I had to be perfect. Now that was a conclusion I came to when I was three or four years old before I had a fully developed brain for sure and before I had the rational capacity. So that is a way, a, that's the kind of limiting, self-limiting beliefs that we can be stuck with like you're talking about. So in this chapter, Belief Engineering, I explain that beliefs are just operating assumptions. They're not sacred. You're not gonna be saved because you believe the right things. You're not gonna be saved because you believe what you were told to believe. You've gotta save yourself. And the way you do that is by taking ownership of your beliefs and subjecting all of your operating assumptions to scrutiny and to review and for testing and ultimately for upgrading. What does it mean to upgrade your beliefs? Hey. 
That's called learning. Yeah. You know, I, I think the idea that somebody sticks to their convictions based on choices they made when they were five years old is just ridiculous. <laughs> that's, a, that's a learning disorder. So we have to learn to, to upgrade our beliefs instead of just defending them all the time because you know, that's what we've always believed. So it's a very good point. That's why I devoted a whole chapter to it on how to do that and how to demystify our beliefs. If they're not sacred, they're not going to save you. You're not going to be saved by faith alone. You know, let's do some good works, people. So this is, uh, this is an important point. It's such an important point uh, to not get stuck in the ruts of belief systems. Mm. Yeah. And Jay, what do you think of that? I think that's great because you know, I can take course after course and trying to figure out this and that, and then we just get stuck more deeper into it. <laughs> So, you know, I say ultimately, ultimately, it doesn't really matter what you believe unless it's useful. You know, I, I think we should choose beliefs that are useful for us, not the ones that we feel like we have to defend as being absolutely true, because we don't have a handle on absolute truth. You know, everything is provisional. Everything is, is subject to review and testing and upgrading forever. We're going to keep learning forever if we're open to it. So. I, I think it's just so important to maintain an open mind and, and, and realize that it doesn't ultimately matter what you believe. Beliefs are important. I mean, if I don't believe that I can get up and walk across the room, guess what? I can't. Yeah, right. I love to lock up. I mean, beliefs are important. Operating assumptions are important, but we want to make sure that they're in alignment with who we are, with what we care about, and we take ownership. That's the adult way to do it, rather than just clinging to the beliefs that we were taught and then sometimes defending them with our life. Yeah. We've got to stop doing that. Uh, can I ask a question? I think, Jay, this may be related. Um, you talk in the book about timing, and I want to have a conversation about timing with you. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, you, you know, great timing, no time, timing, uh, timing is everything, all of the phrases about it. You know, you got to wait for the right moment to say the right thing or not say it. Yeah. But yet, there's not the blueprint that you talk about or you lay out for us in the visionary decision-making process, right? There's just a bunch of phrases that people throw at you when you're growing up. And then if you're lucky, you figure them out. Uh, it's like a hit and miss. T yeah. Tell us a little bit about your perspective of timing, because one of these beliefs that perhaps we carry with us from our family or from something else, you know, it, it may be something like, you know what? not in this lifetime, you're, you're never going to achieve that in this lifetime. Can right. you talk about timing? Well, that's a limiting belief. Yeah, yes, it is. Timing is the holy grail. Timing is the hardest thing. And it's in a way, it's the most important thing because it's the hardest thing. So let's think about if you have to make a strategic decision, you can sort of compare it to playing a game of Go, which has got these little stones. It's an ancient Chinese game or playing a game of chess. You know, if you're gonna make a, a strategic decision, there's two questions that you have to answer. And I devote a chapter to each one of them in the book. The first one is the what question. So the what question is, what is the next best move I could make? Now, some, in some games, you know, like Go, the interesting thing about the game of Go, and why I like to use it as an example is because at any point in the game, there's a number of moves that are equally good, but they might represent a different long-term strategy. So you decide what's the next best move for me to make. And then you decide the when question, which is, and when should I make it? And it's kind of like you use the example of when should I have that talk? When should I say this thing that somebody could benefit from hearing? Um, because that's so important. You know, the Buddha said, if you have something to say that's true, but not helpful, don't say it. If you have something to say that's helpful, but not true, don't say it. If you have something to say that's both true and helpful, well, then you can say it, but wait for the right time. So that's the timing thing. So how do we learn timing? Well, you know, the what question, logic can help with that. And I've got a whole logic system in the book that's much better than pros and cons. And, and I won't go into detail right now, but it's, there's a chapter on, on how to use logic. It's a very simple system, but it's very effective. That helps us narrow down what our reasonable choices are or what our possible choices are. And then the second question, the when question, and the reason it's so tricky is because 
It's 100% intuitive. So there's really no formula for perfect timing. If there was, people would be, you know, winning the lottery all the time or, or, or having success left and right. There's no formula for it, but there is a capacity for it that's cultivated by cultivating intuitive intelligence. So we have to learn to become more intuitive. How do we do that? You know, we notice synchronicities. We give them credit. We're on the lookout for synchronicities. That's one way to do it. That's kind of a fun way to do it. You mentioned the, the synchronicity journal, but whether you use a journal or not, when you start to notice these amazing coincidences that happen and not just dismiss them and just ask yourself, whoa, is that one of these signs and omens that the Bible was talking about? You know, <laughs> what's the meaning? You know, Carl Jung defines synchronicity as a meaningful coincidence. Yeah. What's the meaning? Well, only you can assign the meaning because it's, in, it's relative to your values, it's relative to your desires, it's relative to your life. So we can notice synchronicities. We can do divination. When you do the I Ching, you're improving your intuition because you have to use the intuition to read between the lines. It's not going to tell you exactly anything. You know, it's basically going to basically what a divination system does, whether it's tarot cards or or, or the I Ching, it stimulates the intuition to think outside the box around problems that logic can't handle. And if you get one new idea, that's it's done its job. It's not going to tell you what to do. It's not going, it's just another input but it's an input that stimulates the intuition and in order to do it correctly you really need to calm down and in order to access intuition in general we just need to calm down we're so anxious we're so yes. hyper we're so in a hurry and i i'm the worst offender don't get me wrong but it's just it's hard to calm down that's why meditation and mindfulness is another tool for activating intuition so i have these tools in the toolbox that i talk about it, it, and so here's the thing about timing. If you improve your intuition, your timing is going to automatically improve because it's an intuitive decision. Yeah. So really, so it, all, yeah. Does that help, Jay? Yeah, this is a great conversation. I'm just listening intently to this. this is, it always makes sense. It always makes sense, too. Awesome. Thank you, Jay. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Thank you yes, for thank calling you. in. Thanks. Um, I know. We, uh, let's go ahead and skip the breaks, Benny, if we could. Um, Paul, I wanted to just have you walk folks through right now. And of course, there's much more in the book, but really walk folks through the process, because I, I think for me, this was so affirming you know, as I was reading it. Just if you don't mind, just talk about the process. Well, I, I don't mind. In the book, in the second part of the book is the how-to part, and that's the visionary decision-making process, part two. And basically, it starts with self-knowledge. In part one of the book, I explained synchronicity principle. And I also explain um, in what I call infinite intelligence, but it's basically what Napoleon Hill referred to. It's the same thing Carl Jung was talking about when he talked about the collective unconscious which kind of gets back to something you said, because you were talking about determination, you know, and timing. And there's the third thing, you know, I could talk sometimes to entrepreneurial groups, and I say the three primary things you gotta have is determination, which is never say die, just yeah. like that. I mean, you're, the, you're a warrior woman. I am so yeah. impressed by you, and it's, you're such a great example for the rest of us. And then there's what I call serendipity, which is the timing factor being in the right place at the right time or noticing when the opportunities arise, which is sometimes signaled by a synchronistic event. Yeah. And then the third one is resourcefulness. Resourcefulness. You know, when people used to ask me when I was an entrepreneur, I was a bootstrap entrepreneur, man. No, I had no investors. I had no family money. I just gutted it out. And I basically starved for 13 years before I got to deal with AOL that, made the company, my online company, became the world's largest astrology website because we were serving all of AOL horoscopes and then all of Yahoo horoscopes. So, but for 13 years, I was barely keeping it together. I had determination like crazy because I was following my fascinations. And I know. I, and I had good intuitive skills because I had been using the I Ching my whole adult life. And, but the third thing was the resources and people would, uh, or res I call it resourcefulness. And people would say, well, who, you know, who's your, what, who are your backers? And I go, oh, 
no worries, my backer has infinite resources. And so I talk about that in, 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 in the first part of the book about the fact that you can tap in to this source of limitless creativity and inspiration, which I call infinite intelligence, uh, through the use of that intuitive antenna again. And so that all leads up to self-knowledge, which is self-discovery, which is the first step of the visionary decision-making process. Hey, let's figure out who am I? What do I love to do? What am I fascinated by? And let's, let's, let, let's key in on that because it's probably going to be the intersection of two things that you're fascinated by that's going to lead to some creative breakthrough for you or some fulfilling breakthrough, even if it isn't a day job. You know, I tell people, don't, don't, don't disparage your day job. Right. Day job is a pretty good thing to have. Yep. You know, I mean, everybody has a day job. My day job now is to pay my taxes and to manage my investments, which isn't taking up a lot of my time. And then I run the Divination Foundation, but that's kind of just a work of love. I don't get paid for that. Yep. But, um, you know, a day job is a good thing. As long as you're not causing any harm, honor your day job. I learned a lot of skills in my day job. When I was a marketing guy in the software industry, I became a direct mail specialist and I learned how to do direct marketing. Well, when email and web pages came along, that was a direct marketing wet dream. But I was basically motivated by the content. I was motivated by the fact that I wanted to propagate uh, these spiritual experiences using technology. Uh, that was what excited me, but I had these skills. I had this core competency in direct marketing. I was sending 6 million emails a week. You know, we had 10 million members. By the time I sold the company, it had 10 million registered members. And we were doing a lot of marketing. You know, every time it was somebody's birthday, I'd give them 100 karma coins, which was tokens that they could use to buy a, yeah. a tarot reading or whatever. Oh, my God, it blew people's minds. It's like if I met people on the street, they'd go, oh, thank you for that birthday present. But I knew how to send them an email, a personal email on their birthday because we knew everybody's birthday because it was astrology, stuff like that. So I would, I, my day job did me a world of good. Um, so I don't want to disparage that. But when you find out what fascinates you, your avocation, that's so important. Yeah. You know, what do you want? What is your desire? You know, and then I've got a whole yeah. thing in the book. I've got a creative manifestation meditation in Appendix A. Yes. Which is all about attracting. It's kind of like leveraging the law of attraction. Yeah. And then going beyond it. And the last step is making decisions and making yeah. the right moves at the right time. So there's yeah. that. And then I get into uh, using mindfulness exercises to increase your intuitive sensitivity and also to quiet all the noise coming in the system. We, yeah. It's so important. I, I'm telling you, I, I, by the time I, I got to the appendix of your book, this is this is one of the few books that I've gotten a hold of where the appendix. OK, this is not an insult. This is like a compliment where the appendix was actually equal to, if not better than the book itself in a lot of ways. Oh. And I was like all over this. Look, we got three minutes left, but here's what I want to say. You're showing up in my life just right at the right time. Because as we move forward, we're getting ready to launch a crowdfunding campaign on two things, uh, but to accelerate our technology platform and uh, our AI app. Of course, you know, we, we're doing this in the world we live in. But there was a moment in time where I started to second guess myself because I was in front of, what do you want to call them? A number of people, uh, backers or what, whatever the language is, right? Right. For Nervous people. investors. Yeah. <laughs> and so they take one look at me, number one, and they're looking like, uh, really? <laughs> and then number two, they're like, how do you know? And then number three is this one. Who are you going to get to support your crowdfunding campaign? Do you know people that maybe will help send emails out? Do you know anybody that knows direct marketing? Do you know? And you know, I just looked at them and very simply said, yeah, I have an abundance of resources. There exactly. <laughs> I love it. You know, that's one thing nobody can ever take away from you. And I want to say this to the audience too, resourcefulness, your creativity and resourcefulness, that's your safety net. 
Nobody could ever take that away from you. That's the only security there is yep. in life. Yep. Yep. And you know, the last thing I want to say is this. I think there'll be people that come in front of us and what did you call them? Nervous, whatever they are. Nervous investors. We have to be really protective, I think, in a lot of ways to not absorb whatever it is that's causing them to be nervous. Right. And I, I think that, you know, when I read your book, again, at a perfect time for me right now, because I wasn't going to move forward with our crowdfunding initiative and I wasn't going to move forward announcing what our AI was and what it was about and how it ties into the radio technology. I really was, was nervous. And then I read your book twice. Wow. And I thought to myself, no, Pat, no. This book and Paul are being put in front of you and your team exactly at the right time with the right message. And right, I use the word right very loosely. I understand. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Because I think we need to borrow the faith of others sometimes, Paul, when yeah. we get in a place where we may not be 100% believing that we could do it, um, but our desire, and I love the word, helps us. Thank you for all you're doing. One last question. Um, website again, if you don't mind, and how to get the book. I'd love to know your personal message. What would you like to leave us with today? And thank you for everything that you do. Thank you. It's been a pleasure being on here. Uh, my website is divination.com. That's spelled D-I-V-I nation.com. And it points to intuitiveintelligence.org, which is the website about the book. Yeah. And in terms of a parting message, I think I want to share one of my favorite slogans that I made up that is so in alignment with what you just said. And that is take the risks that grow you. If you take the risks that are going to grow you, you can't lose no matter what the outcome, because you're going to grow from it and you're going to be a bigger person and you're going to learn exactly what you need to learn. So that would be it. Take the risks that grow you. I love it. Thank you, Paul O'Brien, everybody. This book is fantastic. Intuitive, intuitive intelligence, make life changing decisions with perfect timing. And please, if you read the book, make sure you keep going to the appendix, right? And please. make sure you give it a review on Amazon. I'm going to give it a review on Amazon, because I'm telling you, there's no turning back for me. And this is not just for me. I work with a team of brilliant people. And we know for sure that what you've done in the world is exactly where we want to be. We want to be at the place where we too could give back and fuel other people's dreams. Thank you, Paul, for everything. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for tuning us in and turning us on. Benny, Zach, Kat, Jessica, we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.